you in this lesson from the writings from 2 Samuel. Specifically, I want you to consider chapter 16 because it so represents what goes on right now. Say amen when you're there. Chapter 16, Second Samuel. The word of God reads, when David had gone a little beyond the summit of the Mount of Olives, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, was waiting there for him. He had two donkeys loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 bunches of summer wheat, and a wine skin full of wine. You may be seated. What are these for? King asked Ziba. And Ziba replied, the donkeys are for the king's people to ride on. And the bread and summer fruit are for the young men to eat. And the wine is for those who become exhausted in the wilderness. We live in a wilderness, we don't you know? Oftentimes, they're self-constructed wilderness, but it's a wilderness nevertheless. And the wilderness is wherever there's a lack of peace, a lack of joy and activity 24-7. There's a lack of happiness. Some wilderness might be stocked with happiness, but no joy. Some wilderness may have what looks like joy, but there's no peace. So this word says wine is for those who become exhausted in the wilderness. That was part of the package that he brought. And where is Miss Fibbershot? Miss Fibbershot, the son of uh, Saul's grandson, the king asked him. He stayed in Jerusalem. He said, today I will get back the kingdom of my grandfather, Saul. Now you gotta be careful when people come bringing this stuff because you gotta check their motive. He said, today, he's talking about Mephibosheth. He said, today I will get back the kingdom of my grandfather, Saul. And he was the son of Ebersheth. He was in the line Saul, King Saul. So here he is, according to Ziba, plotting against David, trying to take back the kingdom that belonged to my grandpa. Verse 4 says, In that case, Ziba, in that case, David told him, I give you everything that Mephibosheth owned. I bow before you, Ziba replied. And if you can have, every, because this guy is plotting against me and you brought me the information, everything that he owns is now belongs to me. I'm stripping him. I'm gonna give you what he has. I bow before you, Ziba replied. May I always be pleasing to you, my lord the king. And as King David came to Barurim, a man came out of the village cursing them. It was Shimi, son of Gerah, from the same clan as Saul's family. He threw stones at the king and the king's officers and all the mighty warriors who surrounded him. Get out of here, you murderer, you scoundrel, he ordered and shouted at David. The Lord is paying you back for all the bloodshed in Saul's clan. 
You stole his throne. Now the Lord has given it to your son, Absalom. Oh, no, Hebrew it is. I did this for life. At last you will take some of your own medicine. You are a murderer. Why should this dead dog curse my Lord, the king, Abishai, son of Zuriel, demanded? Let me go out and cut off his head. Have no business talking to the king like that. Let me take care of this idiot. Let me go stop him. No, the king said, David said. Who asked your opinion? You sons of Zerah. If the Lord has told him to curse me, who are you to stop him? Then David said to Abishai, to all his servants, my own son is trying to kill me. You know that Absalom was David's boy. Doesn't this relative of Saul have even more reason to do so? Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to do it. And perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wrong and will bless me because of these curses today. So David and his men continued down the road. And Shemi kept pace with them on a nearby hillside, cursing as he went and throwing stones at David and tossing dust into the air. Sometimes you don't want to fight, but a fight just keeps following you. 14, the king and all who were with him grew weary along the way, got tired. So they rested when they reached the Jordan River. Go with me now. Meanwhile, this is, this is where the story goes. Absalom and all the army of Israel arrived at Jerusalem accompanied by Ahithophel. When David's friend Hoshi, the archie, arrived, he went immediately to see Absalom. Long live the king, long live the king, he exclaimed. Long live the king. Is this the way you treat your friend David? Absalom asked him. Why aren't you with him? I'm here because I belong to the man who is chosen by the Lord and by all the men of Israel, Hushai replied. And anyway, why shouldn't I serve you just as I was your father's advisor? Now I will be your advisor. Then Absalom turned to Ahithophel and asked him, what should I do next? Obviously, this man had a reputation with David. So Ahithophel told him, go and sleep with your father's concubine, for he has left them here to look after the palace. Then all Israel will know that you have insulted your father beyond hope of reconciliation. And they will throw their support to you. So they set up a tent on the palace roof where everyone could see it. And Absalom went in and had sex with his father's concubine. Absalom followed Ahithophel's advice, just as David had done. For every word Ahithophel spoke seemed as wise as though it had been directly from the mouth of God in the eyes of the people. Thus reads that 16th chapter, and from this, you heard in the reading a number of areas that should have blessed you. David was forced from his place in Jerusalem, and so he was running away from his boy. And it not only put his own kingship in jeopardy, but it also opened the door to further contention for the throne between the dynasties of Saul and David. And if you lift that up, often when we have dissension between family members, you don't recognize that someone else is standing on the outside waiting for y'all to kill each other. 
And then they will get what's left. So, so here we had Saul's people waiting for David and his boy to duke it out. And then when they were very weak, they would come in like a vulture and take everything. And that happens to us often in moral issues or issues of the heart and spirit. When we are so caught up on doing something to please man, and yet we're pulled by the spirit of God within us. Yeah. And, and that's a fight going on. So the enemy was just kind of sitting to the side, waiting for you to get so tired that he can walk, come right in and whip you till you roll like Oprah. Yeah. We, we can't seem to get out of this need to be accepted by everybody. That that's an internal struggle. We can't seem to get out of this need to not only be accepted by everybody, but also to be considered of value. Right. You know, I, I'm a person of value. I got something to, to offer. Y'all need to recognize that I'm a person with, with value, and you need to treat me as a person with value. So the enemy waits as that fight goes on, knowing ultimately you're never going to win that fight right. on your own strength, but you're fighting on your own strength. I think that we spend money, whatever amount we have, little or large, it doesn't matter. It's all the same, actually. Buying stuff mm. that is supposed to impress other people. Yeah. Yeah. We've even gotten to the point now where we even buy food to impress other people. You want to show them how healthy you can eat. Yes, you do it. Matter of fact, you do all of that and then go drink a Coca-Cola. I mean, come on, you know. What's up with that? Does that make any sense? But, but we have this need to be seen in a certain light. We, we dress a certain way. You've often heard me say this many times, and, and I know some of you will get very uncomfortable with me making this statement, but I need to make it because I got a lot of young people in here, and I don't want them to follow bad examples. Uh, men should dress in such a way that they honor God. They should operate in their choice of clothing. You don't need to be walking around with your behind showing, and people can see what color your drawers are. And, that's, that's unnecessary, and if you knew the real history behind it, you would not do it anyway. Because that, yeah, there's a history to that. And so what you're doing, you're, you're advertising. Ladies, ladies don't have to w wear stuff that shows every curve in your body and every seam in your behind. Why do we do that? It's because we feel unappreciated deep down on the inside, but we can't admit that. So we become, we become uh, caught up in, in displaying. It's a displaying spirit that engulfs us. And we have a need to, to show everything we got with the hope that somebody's going to at least pay attention. Now, we would never admit that to ourselves. Right. But nevertheless, you're, you can tell an apple tree by the apples on it. So if it's an apple on it, you can say it's not an apple tree all you want. It's an apple tree. And if it's oranges on it, then it's not an apple tree. Well, the same is true with us. Your behavior will tell your true beliefs and what's really underneath that. Y'all listening? Yeah. As I said, I knew it would be a bit uh, uncomfortable, I, but I want you, to, I don't mind uh, you, the, uh, making the comfortable uncomfortable. Yeah. Don't mind that at all. And I want the uncomfortable, you've walked in uncomfortable, I want to comfort you, but I want those who are too comfortable in yourselves to become uncomfortable. You don't, you don't gain any ground when you're into that mode of trying to do it your way. You know, your way is not always and perhaps never the best way. So, so we have this battle going on. And so uh, Absalom was in the process of seizing power in Jerusalem. But, but this by no means implied that he could also gain control over the other tribes. He was fighting his, he had, a, he had a battle going on in a little immediate area. 
but you can go to thinking you're all of that when you're just dealing with, with the kindergarten stuff and grade school stuff and maybe even high school stuff. But when you get into the big leagues, you go to find it out that where you thought you were a giant, you're really a midget. Right. Right. And it will show up in what happens to you next. Y'all listening? So, so here he was believing that he was getting ready to take over his dad's kingdom. David was a bad dude. And plus his dad was a killer. And uh, although he didn't want anybody killing his son, and, um, but it didn't mean that he wasn't capable of doing it. And, and so you are going up against someone without doing all of your research. Uh, the shakeup in David's own family began to revive the hope among Saul's family that they might be able to recover the kingdom that God had taken from them. See, they, they were confused. They thought it was about David, but it was really about God. David was God's choice. It, Saul was man's choice, but, but David was God's choice. So no matter what happened, they were never going to be able to overthrow David. They couldn't overthrow David because to overthrow David would mean to overthrow God, and that cannot happen. I hope you hear what I'm saying. So uh, we find in these first few verses as we read through this text, and it's a good text to read, and I, I strongly recommend that you go back and do your own reading on it because it's going to bless you. It'll take you to a whole new place if you read it and you read it with understanding. But as you get into this text, you see the first evidence uh, of the reactions of Saul's grandson, uh, Mephibosheth, to David's withdrawal while the king was heading east across the Judean hills, which we described. He was met by Mephibosheth's, Mephibosheth's servant, Ziba, who out of gratitude, he said to David for his past kindness toward him now provided the fugitive king donkey. I know you're on the run, King David, and I want to give you some duckies. I want to give you some food for your people. I want to give you something to drink because it's hot and thirsty out there. So he said, well, where, where is, your, where is your, your boss? So he's back in Jerusalem, and he's back, back at the house. He's plotting on how he's going to take your kingdom from you and return it back to its rightful owner. So, so David, in a, in a decision, right on the spur of the moment, say, okay, well look, because you've been kind to me and because you've given me this intel on what he's doing, I'm taking everything from him and I'm gonna give it to you. And Ziba just bowed down and said, great, man, I appreciate that. Except, Ziba was lying. You'd have to go back and read a little further in the book, but get into the fourth chapter, uh, around the uh, fourth verse, you find out that Meshavah was not doing that. He was not trying to take over the kingdom. He was not watching to see what was going to happen. Matter of fact, you'll find that he was being kind to David all the time. But people are lying on you without cause. They have something that they're trying to gain. So they will misrepresent you in order to gain something for themselves. Are y'all listening? So you got to be very careful. Don't, don't just buy the first thing that comes out of a person's mouth. The Bible says it takes two, at least two or three witnesses. So, so test what's being told to you. I, I love the scripture that I heard uh, uh, the Reverend uh, Regatta say, uh, speak from in that first Corinthians chapter 15, 33. That's one of my favorite texts because it, it keeps you grounded. You know, you got to be careful about who you hang out with. You don't, you don't just run with anybody because to run with anybody is to run with anything. And, and you don't know it, but sometimes you go to defending filth. Yeah, well, that's my friend. Yeah, but it's filth. Yeah, but, uh, but I mean, uh, you know, it's my friend. I'm not going to judge my friend. I'm not judging him. I'm just telling you it's filth. So, so why don't you just cut that loose and move over here where purity is. So, so David, in, in this time of, of his, his anxiety, didn't do the test. So as a result, he made a decision. Now, Ziba was very clever. He was cunning. It was always his intent to try and get more for himself. And you know people just like that. They're always in it for themselves. 
No matter what they say, they say nice things to you, but they're in it for themselves. I wish I could recount. No, I don't wish that. But uh, there's a, a line that that uh, comedian uses. And if I tell you his name now, you're going to know what I'm saying. And I was about to say, so I'm not going to do that. But he would say, the young ladies, you all should always know that the guys who's looking at you and watching your behind and all, he got one thing in mind. It ain't about what he can do for you. One thing in mind. Right. So you can look up uh, him you know, on your own. And I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying that you got to be very careful about why a person, why are you telling me this? That should have been said. What, what, Mephibosheth is doing, what, why are you saying that? You're his loyal servant, why are you saying, yeah, cut his head off. But instead, he said, no, give him, give him, I'm giving you everything right now. And I'm going to make sure it's certain that you are richer than him, or at least as rich as he was. So, he was lying, and you can go back and do the research on that yourself, and you find out that liars can sound like they're telling the truth. I know a whole bunch of people, great liars. As a matter of fact, I was talking to some politicians recently, and uh, I said, well, I don't really have that much of a love relationship with politicians. I know a lot of them, but we, we're not, we're not, you know, we don't, we don't sleep together. <laughs> no, we don't walk together. We don't ride in the same car together. Because uh, in order to be that, you have to be a person who will bend the truth. And to bend the truth, is to tell a lie. See, the, the, it's binary. It either it's true or it's false. So if I'm bending it, it's no longer true. Therefore, it must be. Hello. So, so be careful. That's all I'm saying to you. David, David, David encounters Shimei, who was another relative of Saul. See, when you when you're in trouble, you're going to find out that when it rained, it poured. And, and no matter what you're going through, there's more yet to go through. So, so here he was. And so he met Shimei, another relative of Saul, who greeted him and his officials at, at Barim, which is east of the Mount of Olives, which is the course he was on. And, and he was cursing him and throwing rocks at him and, and trying to physically abuse him. And, 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 and he taught it, David, with the observation that since he was a man of blood, God was now avenging the death of Saul and his family by driving David from power. Now, David didn't kill Saul. David could have killed Saul, but he didn't right. kill him. Matter of fact, Saul fell on his own sword. So, so it wasn't that David killed him. But nevertheless, your, your, your close friends and your relatives can sometimes get things misconstrued. And, and so they go to talking about, uh, uh, I'm, you know, I got your back. Yeah, but, but if you got it wrong, you don't have my back. You, you just get me into more trouble. Yeah. I know people who are doing prison time right now because they stood up in the, in the midst when they should have been sitting down. And they, and they spoke up when they should have been quiet. And then they let people speak up on their behalf who had no reputation themselves. So, so such was the case here with this brother. And, and so he's throwing these things. Now you need to know that in that day, that was a death sentence. So it's not that, that his man who wanted to cut his head off was, was out of line. That, that's exactly what would have normally happened. Uh, David uh, wasn't necessarily acting in compassion, but he was giving some thought to the possibility that maybe, maybe God is indeed using him. You know, and uh, just because you know the Lord doesn't mean that you always listen to the Lord. Uh, many times people talk about prayer. They, they talk about it, but they don't walk about it. It's not, it's not their normal lifestyle to be in prayer. So David, of course, David was a man of prayer, but even the, the people of prayer can get skewed off the course. And you find yourself moving away from the thing that you're very committed to. Now listen carefully to this. So here we have this guy who is, who is really doing something that should bring in the death penalty. All right? Shemi's real complaint was that David sat on the throne. Listen carefully. Folk can see where you are and what the Lord has blessed you with, and they're upset with you because you got it. They're looking at you and saying, you don't deserve that. 
what does deserves have to do with this? Look, 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 you need to know favor ain't fair. If, if God wants to bless you, he's going to bless you. He doesn't ask nobody for permission to bless you. So, so this, this, this guy was upset. He was really talking about, why, we, why should you be on the throne? You know, Saul ought to be on the throne. And people look at you like that. Why should you have that as a husband? You know, you, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you're not smart enough. You don't have the necessary background. And, and, and you've got this guy and he's a, he's a, he owns this big electronics company and, and he's walking around with you. When he shows up to a place, he walks in with you. Well, to you, that woman he walks in with may be low, low. But to that man who walked in with her, she's a queen. Yeah. And, and if you're not careful, if you go to put my queen down, you got a serious problem with me, the king. You, you understand what I'm saying? So, so you got to be very uh, careful that, that when, you are, when you're looking at a complaint, try to understand what the bottom line is. What, why is it that that's really going on? What do what you really want? See, you're, you're drawing all these big, well, I want to know... Uh, you shouldn't be on the throne. That, that ought to be my pe people on the throne. And you don't need to be driving around no big white truck. Anyway. Now, now, <laughs> Davis, Davis, I'm not going any further with that. I just want to say that. You know, why, do, why should you deserve? Deserve's got nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it, guys. God will show favor on whom he will show favor. And so the, you need to back up back up off that kind of stuff and trying to draw some kind of and throwing some shade at people stop doing that see if you if you want if you want to be blessed then you talk to god about you not not about me not about anybody and look 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 if you really want to be blessed see who god is blessing and then you bless that person you bless the one that god blesses and then watch what god will do you know remember solomon remember solomon he's in this bloodline right uh, Solomon, who David's boy, took over after Absalom and all that crew was wiped out. Solomon was building this temple, and as, after he got it built, he said, uh, Lord, I mean, this is your house, and uh, it's dedicated to you. And the Lord said the words he said. But then the Lord said, well, okay, I'll tell you what. Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. Come on, y'all read that, right? So he said, Lord, I want wisdom to care for your people. Key words. If you want to be blessed, learn how to bless those whom God has already blessed. Look, look, it, it's contagious. When Solomon said that, God says, whoa, you want to take care of my people? Not only am I going to give you wisdom, I'm going to make you the wisest man. Oh yeah, you, you didn't ask me for any money, but I'm going to make you the richest man ever. All because you want to take care of my people. So, so change, change your tactics, guys. Um, change your tactics. If you, if you, yeah, change your tactics. Uh, Abishai, who was, a, was a, a, a David's bodyguard. By the way, Abishai was also David's nephew. So not only am I, is he my bodyguard, but he's also uh, my nephew. So he's, he's coming to my defense because that's his job but also because I am his uncle. So, so there's a reason that, that this is happening. Now, I just want to put this little note in here that I'm closing this whole discussion. That, um, well, let me paint a picture first. You know, I, I go in a lot of places that, that some would say, oh my God, what, are you going in that place? Yeah, I go in there. I'm looking for, for folk that need to be found. So uh, this, you ought to be doing it yourself. But I'm doing it, and so um, sometimes um, you are, you're not giving it any serious thought other than the fact that you're on a mission. So when I'm on a mission, I'm not paying any attention to what else is going on around me. I might be healed, but I'm a strap, but I'm not paying any attention right. to what's going on. You see, so I walk in sometimes with my sons. Now my sons look, look like giants <laughs> compared to me. So one is on one side, the other is on the other side. Well, I walk in, the people who might would have risen up against me, they're looking at the boys and they say, we better not fool with this dude. Let, can we just let him go on and do what he's going to do so they can get out of here? Well, let's take that picture now and expand upon it. 
when you're walking with the Lord, the Holy Spirit is behind you like a great big shadow. And no matter where you are, you are covered. And when you're walking in him in obedience, he shows up. I'm trying to get you to see this picture here. So when the enemy wants to attack you, he cannot attack you because he can't get beyond your bodyguard. The Holy Ghost is our bodyguard. Are you listening? So, so, so learn how to deal with that issue and, and, and find out what God really wants you to do is to trust him in all things. And when you start to trust him in all things, you're going to realize that there's nothing you can do that God will not bless if you trust him. David told Abishai, no, don't, don't kill him. And yeah, I know you call him a dead dog, and he probably should be. He's worthless and despised, but don't kill him. Don't, don't kill him. Um, it might be that uh, he's cursing you as an instrument of God himself. So when you're not in tune because of your anxiety, and this is my closing statement here, when, you, when you're caught up in your own stuff, your own worries, now listen, when you find a person who's always in a hurry, that's a person who generally lives with worry because hurry and worry go together. Yeah, it's very different. Now, we don't think about it that way, but, but the reason I'm hurrying is because I'm worried. And I want to be sure that I do something. I need to get something done. Well, if you had planned it, you wouldn't have to be rushing, right? Hello. So the fact that I didn't plan it puts me in a state of anxiety. So anyway, so, so here we have a, a situation where this guy is really, really caught up and want to help David. And David, of course, says, no, don't do it. It might be God talking. But when you're in your anxiety, you can misread stuff. God did not send Shimei to, to hurt David. That was, the, that was the, 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 the strategy of the enemy to get David further caught up in his anxieties. Now, remember, I'm talking about David. I'm, I'm making sure you're clear that David was still, according to God, a man after God's own heart. So you can't be putting David out and saying he wasn't this or he wasn't that. No, he was a man after God's own heart. But even a man after God's own heart or a woman after God's own heart can fall flat on their face occasionally when they get caught up in the stuff. And folk got so much stuff that they be putting in front of you, man. I'm telling you, sometimes it is just sickening the much stuff, the amount of stuff people can put in front of you. And so you're trying to wade through it and wade through it. So I just, this is just my cross to bear. No, it's not. Go the other way, yeah, or go around it, yeah. or don't even go in that door. Yeah. So David drew a conclusion that may not have been the best conclusion for him. And um, later on, if you read in the next chapter, you'll find out some of the outcomes, which I'm not going to steal that from you. I just want you to see in this particular message here that you can draw the wrong conclusion by having the wrong information. You can bless the very people who are really in it for themselves and therefore a curse to you. And you can hear and see people who are coming at you wrongly and, and accusing you wrongly and give them the credit that maybe God has sent them. God did not send them. God does not do that to those whom he loves. Please hear me. He, will, he was wounded for my transgression. By his stripes, I am healed. So the one that, that, he, that took the wounds that I should have borne, the ones who who got the stripes on his back that I should have gotten, is not going to throw send someone else at me to give me any wounds. Now, do I get wounded? Yes, we all do. But God never wastes a wound. He may not have wounded you. But if you're wounded, God does not waste that wound. He will bless you through your wounding. Can y'all hear what I'm saying? I say he will bless you. Say, well, when, when I was a kid, a small kid, I drank some lye and died. And, um, and I got revived. Uh, I didn't know anything about what God may be doing. But, but anyway, I, ju I just know that they told me I, I quit life. And then uh, Mama prayed like she was out of her mind. And God must raise me up I, since I was five, four or five years old. I can't tell you the details on that. I just know that was the story they tell me. But it was later on in my college days when I was in my major and I got drafted. They were killing people in Vietnam left and right. And so when they came to me, they, they sent me the car and I had to go down and all that stuff. And they asked me, they said, well, do you have any problem uh, with this? Yeah, no, no, none of those things, because I wasn't gonna lie. But 
what about swallowing? I said, well, sometimes I might have a problem swallowing. They had to go back and investigate. And then so they sent me back. I got the, the engineering deferment, but also because there was this question mark, they never called me to go into active duty. Now, remember, I, I got a commission in the ROTC, so I could have gone in, I guess, as an officer. But the reality is that they, they could not make up their mind whether they should send me or not. And they had all these other black brothers to send. A lot of my friends went over and got killed and, and, and died from different things, but not me. So, so God used that wound in my life to make a winning in my life. I moved from being wounded to being a winner across the board. Now, it wasn't the only time I ever died. I died again uh, on an airplane once. And, and that's a whole different long story. But the, the bottom line is that God used that to open some additional doors that I didn't even know were present to me. So what I'm trying to get you to see, when you look at me, I'm, you're looking at a living testimony. I'm t I can tell you things that are real, not what I heard, not, not what somebody said. I can tell you stuff that is very real. I know what God can do. And if I'm telling you he'll do the same thing for you, you need to listen. He's able. I'm trying to get you to see God is able. He's a, he can raise you up. But you've got to trust him enough to do it. And I learned to trust him. I, no, I wasn't trusting him at no four or five years old. I trust my mama, but I, and I trust my mama, but I didn't trust, I didn't know, even know God. You know, but God knew me. And he knew the plans he had for me. And so what I'm telling you, he knows you, and he knows you by name. And even if you made some bad decisions, God didn't give up on you just because you made a dumb decision. Hello? You made a dumb decision, you walk in the wrong door, walk out of it. Well, maybe I should stay in here and be blessed. You stay in there and stay messed, be, be messed up. But you won't, won't be no blessing there because there wasn't no blessing that got you in there. So don't get confused and think that God gives up on you when you do something stupid. We all do stupid stuff. God loves us enough that no matter what our situation is, he's able to clean you up. When you read the book of 1 John, look at chapter 1 and get down around verse 7, you're going to find out that it is the blood of Jesus that washes us. And then if I still make mistakes, if you go down to that ninth verse, you're going to find the Lord saying, no, but if you confess your sin, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. Now, this is not a license to do dumb stuff. You shouldn't be doing it. If you think before you act, engage your brain before you engage your mouth, you're going to find out that you don't make as many dumb decisions. But when you do make one, regardless of what the situation was, don't think God is out of the picture. He's on your side. Can y'all hear what I'm saying? I heard the song they sang today saying the blood still works. That's a good peppy song and all, but we miss the meaning of it because we get caught up into the beat and you know all that stuff. And that's great. We, we're rhythmic people, so we can't knock that. But you need to think about what that means. The blood still works. The blood, the cleansing power of the blood still works the blood still works Jesus died on Calvary's cross I heard the preacher say it today they buried him in a barred grave he stayed in the grave for three long days early on Sunday morning he got up from the grave with all power in his hand he said look I, look, I got all I need when I came here but now I want you to know it's being manifested to you all power is in my hand all the enemy could do nothing about that because the enemy was one of the few beings in the cosmos that knew that what Jesus was saying was true. Man didn't quite understand it, but the enemy understood that. So the enemy is betting on you not understanding that he has all power in his hand. He can raise you from whatever situation you're in, but you have to trust him. And the way you start your trust is by giving him your life. Choose to give him your life. Choose to give him your life, and he'll fix it. He'll fix your tomorrow. What about my today? Well, you might have to suffer through your today because you may have done something yesterday that causes you to go through some things today. But he'll take care of your future, and you will never go to hell. Are y'all listening? Amen. So yeah, that's fire and brimstone because it's true. Hell is as real as heaven. People who won't talk about hell also shouldn't be talking about heaven because they don't understand heaven. You can't understand heaven if you don't appreciate hell. You've got to appreciate that hell is eternal. 
and to miss going to heaven meant that you had to reject Jesus Christ who is the door into glory. So don't miss Christ. Don't be cute. Don't try to be smug. Don't be sophisticated. No, accept Jesus Christ and do it as soon as possible, even today, as your personal Savior. And watch and see how your life turns around. Is there anybody willing to step up right now and take that challenge to get your life changed? Is there one? No, we're not going to wait a long time.